Hey guys, Ryan here from onproperty.com.au helping you find positive cash flow property. And today we've got a very special interview, something that I'm gonna call uh, Beginner's Journey with a guy called Michael Routh, who's been a long time customer and reader of mine. And we've emailed back and forth a lot and he's got a really interesting life traveling the world and also considering and looking at investing in property. So I thought it'd be great to have him on to hear a bit about his story, what he's doing, and hopefully we can track this over time and maybe get him back in like a year or so and see how things are going. So hey, Michael, thanks for coming on today. Uh, my pleasure. How are you doing? Yeah, good. So let's um, let's start. Tell people what you've been doing because you've been traveling a lot, spending time in, what is it, Tokyo and all these other places. So what do you do and why are you all over the world? Yeah, I guess I am um, I started teaching in Australia for two years and and, uh, and I've always been a bit of a traveler. My mum took me over to Canada when I was in grade, when I was like eight years old and went to school there for a year and just always had traveling in my in my blood I guess and uh, and I was just sort of uh, thinking you know how can I keep doing it with work so I looked into into the travel uh, teaching overseas and um, found these international schools that uh, they're just like normal schools in Australia except obviously the kids that go there tend to be from uh, parents who have gone overseas for a job and they can't speak the local language like Japanese for example so they go to these international schools where it's all English um, English uh, language but uh, it's a normal school so I've been doing that for the last 10 years so whereabouts have you been teaching is it one country in particular or in a lot of different ones yeah I started in Singapore which was great because it was close to close to home and it was um, you know it was a, a, a not easy sort of place to live and a good first kind of first uh, experience so i did 3 years in singapore and then got a little bit uh, too too sort of easy and a little bit bored so i thought i'd go for something a bit more challenging and so i went to egypt for the next 3 years <laughs> which was about as challenging as and as different as you could get so um uh, what's it, it what's so there. challenging about egypt well just i mean singapore was english language very safe and clean and easy to live and you know you get a maid and you get a swimming pool and all that it's very very cruisy living and Egypt was I mean it was just every day was just a different uh you never really knew what was what was happening and there was always something going on and and uh funnily enough I when I was there the revolution um the revolution kicked off and I I, I lived through that so so it was just a lot more I don't know Challenging. The language was challenging. Arabic's very difficult, and uh, just the the whole country. And I mean, it's an, an amazing time, but it's just a lot. It was a lot more challenging than the ease of life in Sydney or Singapore. I guess. Yeah. Well, we have a pretty easy life here in Australia, so I can imagine. Yeah. And living through like the revolution that happened in that, I don't actually know a lot about that. I do remember when the government shut down the internet in Egypt um, yeah. and then Twitter worked out or Google worked out a way that people could call in to tweet and bypass the government um, but right. that's all like was that was that did that happen when you were there yeah 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 that was 10 days about 10 days there was no no phones no internet so you know mum was sitting there watching the news on and looking at all everything getting blown up and tanks and all that and then uh, no contact for 10 days so I was a little uh, a little worried but um, yeah I got through it and it's a what was it? What was it like for you being in that area? Was it like a war zone, or was it just like there was uh, no internet and you just went about your daily life anyway? Yeah, it always looks worse on TV. Like they they obviously focus on the the epicenter of where it was all going down, and and clearly I didn't go anywhere near that. So uh, <laughs> no, it was it was just uh, just not knowing really, not knowing how how serious it was or, or who was involved or what what could happen or what might happen. Um, so like Syria, for example, was a lot worse. For everybody, um, but the Egyptian, uh, it was more about just their problem with them, with the government. It didn't have anything to do with um, foreigners or expats. It didn't affect us directly. So yeah, we just we just bunkered down and, and had ten days off school and just and just uh, watched from a distance and watched it unfold. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. All right. So after Egypt, then where did you go? Uh, and then I've just uh, been back to Asia, south, uh, back in Japan now for the last three years in in Osaka. A little, a little bit more. Going back to, I mean, just Asia in general is just such a. It's just so. It's such a good place. I mean, the food and the, you know, the people and just the, the proximity to Australia. It's so just it just ticks a lot of boxes and, and the packages tend to be consistently good as well. Um, some some packages in maybe Africa or South America or Central America are a little, uh, they're hit and miss. Um, so yeah, Asia seems to be. 
pretty uh, reliable. And by packages, do you mean how much you're getting paid to do your job? Yeah, yeah, just, I mean, that plus the sort of flights and the tax and all that sort of stuff. It's just the whole the whole thing put together, rentals, and so, yeah, it just seems to be, yeah, the best, the best all-around package. Yeah. So let's, um, let's shift, like, across to property because, obviously, like, working overseas for the last 10 years, not spending, you know, the majority of your time in Australia, what got you interested in investing in property and particularly in Australia? If you're living overseas, you know, why not pursue investing overseas? Um you know, yeah, like how did you get started on, okay, well, I'm interested in investing in Australia? Well, my looking at my bank account one day was a bit, <laughs> a bit <laughs> of a shock. Um, yeah, I, I've just been, I just, I mean, I was all from, you know, I, I, I was working when I was 15, you know, pushing trolls that came out and all that. I started early, and but I never really had any real focus or any real sort of long-term goals. I just kind of earned it, spent it, sort of whatever, didn't really think too much and oh, I'm young enough, I'm, I'm still young and then, you know, 20s you hit through university and come out at 20 with a loan and, and no money and had a great time but didn't really think too much about it and then and then working, you know, you're just get, getting things set up and established and then you sort of, I don't know, all of a sudden I was I was mid-30s and going, oh, sh- <laughs> where's all that time and where's all that money going? So I just, it was just a bit of one of those like, uh, First time really that I've actually I actually thought about the future, which was a, a, you know obviously a better late than never. But um, so now I'm just really I guess really determined to make up for that is those sort of ten years of not really thinking much about money and not really doing much about it. And then uh, and I figured just property property just seemed to be the 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 easiest not well not easiest but the less the least risky and the sort of um and just more of a process that you can continue instead of all these other ideas that you know businesses or 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 shares or whatever i just um because i'm you know teaching is it's still fairly busy and takes your time so um i just wanted to do something that i could i could get into without having to be in it every day like like shares for example yeah and that's one of the things like like I've said before, like the share market kind of just goes over my head in terms of like understanding how to manage the share market, how to really make money from it. Like I understand you could just invest in a company and just leave it. But in terms of like these people who are doing day trading and or people yeah. who are working on the foreign exchange and trading currencies yeah. and stuff, like that stuff just sounds like too much work to yeah. me. And I like yeah. I like the idea of property as well because it's like it's a larger capital investment, but then it's kind of it's more passive of an investment strategy than, you know, investing in shares and trying to change them every single day and stuff like that. If you invest in good property, then, you know, it can go up in value. And for me, like I can kind of see, okay, from like towards where I want to achieve financially, I can understand that property would get me there. Whereas with shares, I'm like, well, I don't really know like how that would work. So I'm kind of in the same boat as you, like just seems easier. And it seems like you can, once you do one, then it's, you you don't have to change. You don't have to change with the with the the, the system, or change with the year, or change with what's happening. And it doesn't really matter. It's just the same the same principles. And once you do it once, like obviously the first one's the hardest, and then you just obviously repeat, and and it just snowballs. And it seems to be, yeah, it seems to be the the one the one avenue that seems to you know where it's going, and you can sort of trust it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And what about like, so you don't own any property at the moment, do you? No, I, I owned one a few, oh, about six years ago and it was just, I mean, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I did no research. I did no due diligence. I didn't have, didn't understand property at all, had no mentoring, nothing. So I just went, yep, I'll buy that and great. And, and it was it was okay, but it was just, uh, I didn't understand the process. So so I bought off the plan and, you know, it's it, it went up a little bit. It was in Brisbane, which now it's probably, probably doing okay, but back in the 10 years ago, it wasn't so good and and uh yeah i just i just got rid of it when and just start fresh like to do it properly after this this second time around yeah well even the stats that i've seen about brisbane is that houses are growing but in terms of units they're not growing as much because there's uh, more supply coming into the brisbane market in terms of units things being built um so yeah i don't know like if it would have done well or not obviously right. it's like easier to look back in hindsight and say i should have done things differently but like at least yeah. you've had a stab and like you've got some experience under your belt. So, what do you what do you think will be like your strategy moving forward, and what are you kind of aiming towards? What's your end goal? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, like uh, I'm looking at I'm 
thinking I'll be working uh, probably 15 to 15 to 20 more years. Obviously, less less the better. But um, 15 years, you know, that's a that's looking at um, with, with my situation if, as it is at the moment. Um, I can probably you know buy one property a year for the next 15 years. So um, ideally, ideally, the goal, if if a minimum, would be one property if not more and um you know basically retire on the uh on the passive income and um, replace my income and and um yeah in a mixture of mixture of uh, positive cash flow and and neutrally or negatively geared just to balance the portfolio yep and so the end goal would be financial freedom through the rental income that's coming in basically yeah is that what? yeah that, that's the plan <laughs> and i guess like everyone um like everyone starts with one plan and then as things like progress, you can obviously change your plan over time. You know, like say you did buy one every single year at the end of 15 years, maybe you've got passive income enough coming in to retire. Maybe you have to sell a couple to pay down debt. Like that's one of the things I like about property as well is over time you do get the flexibility to change your strategies or like I was even talking to my friend Ben Everingham who's like a buyer's agent and he was talking about his existing portfolio and you know, he owns a bunch of different properties and is financially free, but there's still opportunities in those properties to kind of increase the return on investment there. And so right. I, I do kind of like that. So what made you think like one property a year for 15 years? Oh, just um, based on my current situation, what I can afford um, to save a deposit. Um, I mean, obviously the, the, the cost of the properties um, at the moment, I can sort of, my borrowing power is around, is around 260. So, so you know that takes away a lot of the capital city options, but there's always the uh, the, the strong regional uh, centres that I'm look, probably looking at for the first few anyway, until the um, until the equity and equity increases in those properties each year, and then you know then I can get into the the stronger uh, markets, the capital cities later on. But um, you know the first one, get in fully, and then just go from there. And how does borrowing work for you? Like if you're earning the majority of your income overseas, do banks in Australia recognize that and can you get a loan or is it really difficult? Yeah, no, not as difficult as I thought it was going to be. Um, they just It's the same process. They, they look at just, you know, send, send uh, they need to see savings and they need to see your credit file and they need to see uh, three months of your, your pay slips from your overseas job and it's in Japanese yen and all that, but you just get it trans- transferred to, translated to... Uh, to Australian dollars, and they, they, there is some formula that they use, the to, to estimate um, the amount that, that that they that they recognise. Like maybe it's a little less than than the uh, a normal Australian. There's no problem. You can plenty of banks will do it. Um, and yeah, it's uh, that hasn't been an issue. Okay, sweet. So, did you have to go through a mortgage broker to find out all of this, or did you just go to a bank? Yeah, no, I went through mortgage broker and, and um, she gave me all the information they need and and um, then it's just a matter of, yeah. I mean, it, I think it was more depends on where you're buying and how much you're buying for and the, and the, the, the factors in those in those areas. Like they're looking, they're, they're, you're more likely to get knocked back for buying a property that they don't, um, that they think is a risk instead of the actual, like my fundamentals of my own, my own finances. Okay, yeah. Sweet. So that's good for people who are overseas and are thinking about, you You know, they want to invest in property in Australia. Um, obviously, because you're an Australian and you have an Australian citizenship or Australian passport, it would make it easier if someone was overseas listening to this and they were Japanese or they were something else, right. then I imagine the situation would be very different. But because yes. you're an Australian, uh, it's much easier for you. Do you need to lodge like a tax return in Australia or because you're overseas, you just do it over there? Yeah, that's right. I, I pay local, I pay local local taxes in Japan. So as far as uh, I'm a non non resident for tax purposes, as far as the ATO is concerned. Um, but when I start buying property, and when I do have property, then obviously I need to lodge a tax return with to do with the property. But as far as my salary goes, it's um, yeah, I'm considered non resident. Um, but as an Australian, I I have the the rights to get the property, like you said. Yeah, that's cool. So um, you said you were talking about looking at regional areas to invest in first. What kind of drew you to those areas? Uh, you, <laughs> <laughs> basically. Um, yeah, I was like when I got back into it, look, started looking. I was just shocked at how 
because I hadn't really followed the market since I sold Brisbane years ago. I didn't really look at it since then. I just got turned off at all and went back in and I was just like, wow, everything's 500, 600, 700,000. Is it now what today? It's a million, a million median price in Sydney is a million, which is just for a humble teacher is obviously out of my, uh, my control. So yeah, so I just that, had friends who bought like a three bedroom shack basically in Sydney, and I think they paid like one point three million dollars for it. That's crazy. It's crazy. So I, you know, obviously, I was like, well, that's no good. So then I started looking at some of the properties that popped up on your on your site, and a lot of those were, you know, one hundred fifty, two hundred, two fifty. That sort of in um, in regional areas. So I was like, okay, I can afford that. And uh, so that's yeah, basically started looking at those. And um, that's where it's that's where it's at. That's where we're at at the moment. Yeah, there's been um, like a few people I know that have actually invested in regional areas. There's a guy who did my course on like finding positive cash flow properties. His name's Nathan Kalis. He was a footy player. Yeah. He invested in Armadale, which is a regional center. There was another guy. His name was Nathan as well. Can't remember his last name. I interviewed him last month, and he started and he invested in a whole bunch of properties in like regional areas or country town, spending like a less than less than a hundred grand on each right. property, bought them all sight unseen, and he did right. pretty well as well. And he got some capital growth out of them. Like I know a lot of people say regional areas don't get as much capital growth as, you know, the capital cities, but sure. for a lot of people they have actually experienced, you know, capital growth in those areas. You just I guess you gotta pick your areas. And so let's talk about like the mentorship program that you've decided to join, what made you choose like a coaching program, a mentorship program, and what made you go with the one that you decided on? Yeah, I, I just thought, you know, first time around, I didn't know what I was doing, and I was, you, you know, you either, what do you do? You listen to people who you hope know, or you Google the hell out of everything, and, and you know, this takes forever. So you just, I was like, you know, I wanted to do it properly this time and, and long term. So I was like, okay, yeah, it's a little bit expensive, but. I'd rather learn learn it properly the first time, and then and then I feel like this the old saying of the uh, you know teach a man to fish kind of thing. Um, you can put, you can buy a buyer's pay a buyer's agent ten thousand commission to go and buy your property, or you can or you can pay you know an amount to learn how to do it yourself. So I really wanted to do it properly and commit to it. So um, I joined this this prop this property company um, ship, and, and it's been great. I've learned already more than I. I would have probably found. Um, yeah, you're yeah. cutting out a bit there. What did you say? Something about oh. the first few months? Yeah, I just. just no, on you, the internet, you're cutting so. out. I can't hear. Uh, what I might do, I might hang up and I might give you a call back and we'll just do voice call for the last bit. Oh, uh, okay. You're cutting out and I can't hear you, and I think it's because the uh, internet's trying too hard to send the video. Oh, uh, okay. Yep. I'll call you back in a sec. Hello? Hey. Yeah, that's heaps that's clearer now. No worries. All right, so let's go back. So with the mentorship program, what have you been learning? Like what have, what have they taught you that you think has been valuable? Um, yeah, well, I guess the first thing was just getting all your financials in, in order, like, uh, you know, checking your credit file, getting all that set up um, and, and ready to go. And, and buying power, your buying capacity. One, one thing, you know, I thought that I was only able to – purchase you know i was looking originally i was looking at really cheap ones like you said like the hundred thousand 110 120 sort of like that um but i was with this buying power table that they take into all these different factors and basically it, it put me up to 260 which i was surprised about and then um you know and then each one you get depending on how much you get rent um you get rent for each property it, that increases your the next buying power for your next your next investment so it's always changing and, and increasing um, and just it, basically, I was you know, I was given more 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 access than I thought I would I would have had due to my my situation. So I'm guessing um, that um, you will probably need to invest in positive cash flow properties to start with in order to increase your buying capacity. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. So they, you know, my like for example, they, I can I can uh, buy for say 460, but I don't have the deposit for that. So. Um, so with the 260 plus the, the new rent coming in, then that'll increase it again. And, and yeah, so the, the first few um, would be positive cash flow to, to bump up, up that, um, that buying power. But, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to the deposit as well. So it doesn't matter how, how high my 
buying power is if I can't afford to to buy in that power, it doesn't really matter, right? So yeah, totally. Do you think you'll do you think you'll expand your portfolio just based off equity, or are you planning to like um, continue to save up deposits to reinvest? Yeah, well, both. I mean, I I, I can sort of fairly comfortably. Um, I mean, and, and the budgeting, looking at the budget was another thing they they did, you know, in detail. Like, you know, I, I was always like, well, I spent about this much, I could save about that much, but doing a budget like basically for a month I, I wrote down every cent I spent in every category and looked at areas that I was spending in and, and how to you know cut back on a few things and so that was kind of um, interesting because you don't really think, think about how much you spend on stuff that you don't really have to if, and until you really look at it. Um, so with the budgeting in mind I, I can comfortably sort of save you know a deposit for a property a year but also as that's happening obviously the the equity from the other previous properties will will come into it as well. So uh, it ends up you know, ideally snowballing in the fact that so I, I'd be able to buy a property a year from my own savings plus another property from the equity. So ideally, as it gets you know, five or six years down the track, I'll, I'll be able to buy two, two or three a year. Maybe it just you know it depends on how how the growth goes in those areas. Well, that's good that you're not reliant on equity because I know like a lot of people invest and they're saying, well, I'm going to buy one and then when that grows in value, then I'm going to buy the second one. But, you know, like your first property purchase in Brisbane, like if you buy off the plan or you do something wrong and it doesn't go up in value, you know, a lot of people get stuck. So I think, yeah, like taking control and continuing to save a deposit for your second property sounds pretty smart to me. And then I guess if you start with positive cash flow properties, then you could potentially... Um, save that cash flow, like the positive cash flow as well. Yep, yep, that's right. So, sort of the more, the more sort of streams that that keep building, the the better. It just eventually, it'll just yeah, it'll just snowball and into. So who knows how many I can get? I mean, I, I've, I've set sort of fifteen as the goal, but ideally, I mean, the more the merrier, of course. Yeah, of course. What about you? Don't have to share it if you don't want to. But what about like, do you have a financial goal that you're aiming for, like? 15 properties sounds great, but is that like are you after a certain amount of income per year? Like for me to be financially free, I would need to earn at least $60,000 a year in passive income. Uh, do you have a figure like that that you're shooting for? Yeah, I mean, um, at 100000 Yeah. And just, you know, it's, it was hard to set that and that was another part of the, of the program was to set goals in, in short term and long term and it's, and it's kind of hard to set goals because it, it, that sounds almost impossible. You think, well, that's, that's, that's just never going to happen. But, but you, you know, if you're going to think so, I feel like that would be a comfortable, that would be a more than comfortable um, income to retire on. And, and uh, yeah, so that's, yeah. Oh, but also they, they change. I mean, I don't know that if that's possible now but in five more years time seeing how things change in 10 years time you can sort of just continually looking back at your goals and, and you have to same with your property strategy you have, you have to keep looking looking at them and reviewing it yeah and you have to keep looking at it and changing it so based on um, the way your life changes and what you need or yeah. if you have a family and you've got more mouths to feed or you know if you right. downsize your life and you don't need as much money things change one of the um, like cool things that I just want to share with people who are listening to this is like something that I found to make property feel more achievable for me was if I set a goal of like let's say $100,000 per year I would then divide that by 52 to get well like how much do I need to earn per week which is like $1,923 I'm just doing the calculations now and then I would um I would then divide it by um, like how much average weekly rent I think I would get for a property so let's say like if I got 350 bucks a week for a property you know then I would need to earn I would need to own like 5.5 properties fully paid off in order to be financially free obviously like assuming there were no costs which they are so maybe bunk that up to like six or seven properties but yeah I, I like for people who are listening I found that as a good strategy to you know because obviously for some people like 10 properties or 15 properties is unachievable for them but for a lot of people you know purchasing like five or six properties and then paying them off over time could be a strategy that, you know, could, yeah, get them a decent passive income as well. So I just wanted to encourage people with that. Um, look, Michael, I think, like, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story and, 
you know, learning about you and like your travels as a teacher, like it sounds, sounds pretty fun and it sounds like you've got a good financial goal. Is there any advice that you would give to people who are in a similar position to you? Not necessarily they're working overseas, but they're about to get into the property market and they have similar goals to you like financial freedom. Yeah, I mean, I just think, um, like I said, you can make so many mistakes, and a lot of, you know, a lot of people just don't really know what they're doing. Like, I, I would, if I had my time again, I would, I would have done my, I would have joined this program earlier, and I would have put more effort into the, into the, the research and and just finding out as much as you can about it before just jumping in and hoping it's going to work. Like, that was all I did. I just, yeah, I'll just buy. I didn't know where I was going to buy. I didn't know why I bought there. I didn't know what the market was doing. I didn't know anything. I just, I just had the money, and I, okay, I'll buy there. So I just figured, that, yeah, I would say do a little more research before you jump in because everyone's always excited when you buy your first property. It's like, oh yeah, this is great. And but if you don't really know what what you're doing or where you, or where you're buying or why you're buying there, and you don't have a you don't really have a strategy or a long term goal, then it's it's kind of I mean you're just hoping it works instead of believing and and really and really knowing that it's going to work due to your due to the work you put in. Yeah, and so what what sort of research do you think people should be doing? Like we can say, yeah, do more research, but a lot of people, I guess, feel stuck at that point because they're like, well, I don't actually know where to start or what I should be researching. Do you think there are certain things people should look into? Yeah, obviously, if you're looking at cash flow or, or capital, different, you'd be looking at different areas. But but there's reports that are that are, that are out there um, based based on a whole bunch of different factors that they look at and they, they can give you, I mean, you can find a previous history of, of growth um, in, in any, from a whole bunch of sites, but there's um, also um, future, like predicted growth, if you're looking at capital growth, um, so you can find reports that will give you, um, you know, or predictions on growth after after five years or 10 years. So it's, um, I guess, using using the the, the the evidence that's already out there in the past as far as previous growth um, and then what's happening in, in the current situation. Um, you know, you could talk to real estate agents on the ground or, to, or going into uh, around, you know, auctions and just getting an, a feel of what's happening today and then, and then also looking at these predictive reports, I, I guess, there's three different ways and three different um, time scales that give you a give you a fairly good indication. And I, I guess the more the more um, research you do, the, the the more you feel comfortable that you've made the right decision. I mean, you know, things like population growth and and uh, infrastructure and and town you know town councils what they're doing in the in the in the area and just just anything that gives you gives you more, more ticks in the boxes. Yeah, I think like especially if you're investing in regional areas, looking at what is the population growth or decline of this area. Because obviously, if population's growing, more people are moving into the area, there's going to be more demand for housing. But if population's decreasing and people leaving the area, well, then there's going to be houses that are sitting empty and there's you know more supply and less demand, which affects prices. So yeah, population growth is great to look at. Um, yeah, as you said, like past growth history is also good to look at. There's a whole bunch of things. Um, that people can look at. I've got some stuff on my site on how to research um, or you could join like a mentorship group like you've done uh, to learn more advanced techniques. Yeah, well, thank you so much for sharing your journey. Hopefully, we'll be able to check back in in like a year or two or something like that and, um, you know, see how you've gone. And I'm pumped to, yeah, I guess pumped to look back on this and to say, you know, here's where you were and look how far you've come. Because I, like I know you were a bit hesitant to do this interview because you like you don't have a large property portfolio, but I think people are going to really resonate with this because a lot of people are in the same position and often like you do interviews with successful people and it just feels like, well, this is unattainable, but to actually do an interview with someone who's getting ready to invest and, you know, just a normal person, I think, yeah, will really help a lot of people. So I just want to say thanks for that. Yeah, no problem. That's so, great. I look forward, to, look forward to seeing where I'm at in 12 months time as well. It's another... You're another another reason for me to keep on track and keep focused and, and be accountable. Awesome. All right. Well, until next time, guys, stay positive.